Israel has sinned again, this time by worshiping the golden calf. What's Moses going to do, and how will God respond? Welcome to Through the Bible. Today, Dr. J. Vernon McGee takes us to Exodus 32 and 33 to learn not only what happened to the Israelites, but also about the proper response to sin in our own lives. So as you hop aboard the Bible bus and find your seat, I want to welcome Greg to the studio. So Greg, did you happen to bring more Why I Love the Bible videos? (laughs) Because, you know, I really honestly can't get enough of those. They're so cool. Yeah, I did because they keep coming in, Steve. And for months now, we've been Uh, sharing uh, these videos and sometimes the audio of the video. You can find them all on uh, ttb.org forward slash love. And the simple question is why I love the Bible, or I'm answering that question. You've done a video. I've done a video. I think mine was a few seconds longer than yours. Yep. Which it is was. pretty much in par with our you know, yep. personalities. Yep. But uh, we are so excited. And we've got a, a couple of great heartfelt ones today. Uh, one with an answer that you and I may not have thought of before. So let's listen to this first one from Melissa. I love the Bible because I can trust it to tell me the truth. I am a Christian who suffers from mental illness. I cannot always trust my mind or emotions, but I can still know the truth because the Bible tells me so. I know there are other believers like me, and maybe you will see this video. The Bible is a firm foundation when everything else around us feels like it's shifting. Hmm. Well, thank you, Melissa, for that vulnerable and also important message to us all. Yeah, Steve, I I think uh, Melissa's Willingness to be transparent about her struggles is an encouragement that we we all have struggles and we all uh, have weaknesses and challenges in our lives. And I I love how she says that God's word is our measuring stick to see Mm -hmm. if we're on the right track. And Dr. McGee often talks about the the parables, yeah, yeah. and the plumb line and the the ruler and the benchmark. So so we really appreciate that. Now, uh, here's one from uh, a gentleman we know. He sent yes. us some cool videos in the past. Yes, our good friend Tom. That's right. Let's hear what Tom has to say. Why I love the Bible? Because I'd be completely lost without it. I've got this old Bible from Through the Bible Radio all taped up. Still works. And hey, without it, where would I be? I'd have no answers. I'd know what not know what to say to people. That's why I love the Bible. Because God gave it to me, and I can give it to others. <laughs> we love you, Tom. Thank you so much. <laughs> you always makes us smile, uh, and I hope we're all like Tom as we uh, as we move through our lives. He just has so much love and energy. I love that beat up old Bible. That's a yeah. that's a great. Uh, I, I think I think there's some great quotes like if your if your Bible's beat up, you won't be, or something right. like that. Yep. Uh, Absolutely. Or if your Bible looks terrible, you're gonna you're gonna be doing great. Looking pretty good. But you know the truth is, Steve, we know that we're speaking to a lot of people. Many of them are hurting, and uh, you know we just want to let our listeners know we we care about you, and we want to just take a little bit of time to pray for our listeners. So uh, would you be willing to do that? Yeah, for I'd us? love to yeah. do that. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity that we have as believers. Even though we don't see each other face to face, we can study together your precious and wonderful word. I pray, Lord, for those that are listening and maybe are feeling isolated and alone. I pray that you would help them to feel connected with the body of Christ uh, in part through the ministry of Through the Bible and that they would know that not only Greg and I are praying for them, but that people on the World Prayer Team uh, are praying for each other all around the world. And what a blessing it is to know that we will one day see each other face to face and be able to share with each other the prayers that we had for one another and learn how those prayers impacted each of the lives of those that we prayed for. What a wonderful time that will be, Lord, in glory. We pray that you would bless the ministry, bless the program as it goes out now. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, last time, friends, we looked at what certainly could be called one of the most precious sights in the Word of God was to see this man, Moses, become an advocate and an intercessor on behalf of his people. And he certainly knew the way into the heart of God. He said to the Lord, when God told him, get down your people that you brought out of the land of Egypt, they've sinned. And Moses said, I don't recall ever bringing any people out of the land of Egypt because I don't have any, but you do. And they're your people and you brought them out. And he gives God some good reasons. And I think that 
today that in our prayer life we ought to be a little more intelligent than we are and learn how to lay hold of our God. He knows our hearts, friends. That's the important thing. There's no use trying to say things with our lips to him that we don't mean with our hearts, but we do need to learn to lay hold of the mighty arm of God. And I wish all of us knew that. Now, when Moses went down, you wouldn't think he'd ever prayed for these people because I tell you he was angry. He threw those commandments down, those tablets of stone. They were broken, and he was hot against the people and against his brother Aaron. And poor Aaron tried to cover up, and if he didn't camouflage and if he didn't attempt to evade, he tried to say he poured in the gold and a golden calf walked out. Now that, my friend, is an explanation. I'm sure Moses must have smiled at that one, and I know God did, and I'm sure that you and I can smile at that because we've offered some ridiculous explanations like that for what we've done that's been wrong. And then we saw that it was a time of real sin, though, for the people. And then Moses moved in. It was extreme surgery. But friends, when you got a cancer, and I know from personal experience, you want to try to get rid of it. And if it means cutting away half your body, you want to get rid of it. Sin's an awful cancer, and God uses extreme surgery here. And there was the slaying of those that were guilty. And now I begin reading here at verse 26, actually. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, every man his neighbor. Now, that's serious, and it's extreme. Sure it is, but there's been awful sin. The way that liberalism got into the church, I have lived now quite a while. I can remember that when I came before a church court to be examined for the ministry, they had another boy there, another young fellow, and they asked him questions, and he was graduate of a liberal seminary. I have never in my life seen anybody who knew as little theology and as little Bible as he did, and what he did know he had all mixed up, and he was as liberal as they come. He didn't have any faith. He had no knowledge. He could never explain the great doctrines of the faith, although he didn't believe them. And the interesting thing is, in fact, one man very impatiently said to him, well, if you don't believe it, at least you ought to know what you don't believe. But he couldn't define it. And then a dear old brother got up and he said, you know, I knew this boy's father. His father was a great preacher of the past and he was sound in the faith. And I know that this boy, well, one of these days come around and He'll be all right and all that, you know, that jargon that they used back in those days and old buddy-buddy brotherhood stuff. And they had a motion and they accepted him. It wasn't unanimous, but they accepted him. And it made me sick at heart to be brought in at the same time with a fellow like that that didn't believe anything at all. Well, may I say to you, that's not the way Moses would have handled it Oh, he wouldn't have drawn a sword in our day and slain the boy, but he sure would have not accepted him. He would have given that boy a Bible and told him to go out and go to Bible school and learn a little Bible and then come back if he believed it and then examine him again. But no, it was all that fault or all, and that's the way liberalism came into the organized denominations today and have taken over. You can't compromise with it, friends. It was Morley who said that compromise is immoral. And I think it is, especially in the church. Moses doesn't do a very good job of compromising. I tell you, there was extreme surgery used. And we are told here that those that were guilty were slain. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. That cleaned up the camp pretty well, by the way. 
They would have been in idolatry, friends. They would have been destroyed out in the wilderness. Now, a great many people are apt to say, my, it was so terrible and brutal and all that. Well, let's look at it this way. Is it best to cut out the cancer here and save the person or save the nation? Think of the women and the children and the young man and the old man that were there that were not guilty. And had they permitted these men, who apparently are in charge now, they had taken over, what would have happened? Why, that entire nation would never have entered the promised land. They'd gone into idolatry now. They would have been absolutely destroyed as a nation. And that, of course, is what's happened in the church in many places. I've seen church after church, friends, lose its importance, its influence, and become practically nil because of the fact liberalism got in. We today are soft, and we are sentimental, and we're silly. The fact of the matter is we're stupid in the way that we are handling evil. And the reason that we are having lawlessness in this land is because that we have not only soft-hearted judges, but they're soft-headed judges. My friend, the law is to be enforced. Now will you notice, we move on to verse 30, it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, ye've sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure, I shall make an atonement for you. That is, an atonement was that which was made to cover up sin. That's the way it was handled before Christ came, and then it was removed. Now, verse 31 is actually another reason that Moses gives to God for him not destroying the people, but taking them up into the promised land. We saw three last time. Now, here is the fourth. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned, a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. What is that? Confession. If you want to get along with God, you will have to agree with him about sin. Sin is sin and it must be confessed. And I don't care who it is, and these are God's people. And Moses goes up and said, we've sinned. This people have sinned. It's a great sin. They made gods of gold, and he spelled out the sin. And I think that's the thing we ought to do when we confess our sins. Spell it out before God. Now listen to Moses. Verse 32, Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin. I don't know what Moses was going to say after that because now he changes his tack and listen to him. And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And Moses said, I take my place with the people. I identify myself with them. And if you intend to blot them out, blot me out. You remember God told him, I can make good my covenant to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by just simply making a nation from you. Moses said, now identify myself with the people if you don't intend to bring them into the land, then blot me out with them. Now notice, this is what moves the heart of God that moves the hand of God. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. God deals individually and personally with sin. Verse 34, Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Now, God says, I'll deal with it personally. And I will take the people up, though. I'll take those up that have not sinned. And my angel will go with me. Now, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, we said, is the visible presence of Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ. The angel of the Lord always reveals the presence of deity, God appearing to man. Now, will you notice as we come now to chapter 33, And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart, and go up hence thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it, and I will send an angel before thee. Now, this is the angel of the Lord. And I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Kittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, and the Electrolyte. All of them are going to be driven out, you see. 
Now will you notice, he's now preparing them to enter the land, and we'll see them resume the wilderness march in the book of Numbers. Actually, the book of Leviticus is the continuation of the instructions for the service of the tabernacle, which now we'll see them begin to set up. They're building it now, and it will be set up, and it'll be the place where they will worship. Verse 3, God says, I am taking you into this land, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Now actually, to say God dwelt with them, or dwelt in the tabernacle, is not quite accurate, of course, to say that. God never has occupied a building. That is always a pagan either notion. That's where he met with them. Or, let me turn that around, that's where they approached God in God's method. And that's actually what the tabernacle teaches, approach to God. And it all, as we've said, reveals Christ and the way that we approach God today. It's given to us in picture form. Now we're told here in verse 4, and when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man did put on him his ornaments. And those ornaments were heathen, remember. For instance, the earrings that they wore, they brought those and made the golden cap. That was an evidence that they worshipped a certain god. It's very much like today a person wears a little cross. However, it's become meaningless, but the purpose of it is to reveal that the person who's wearing it is a Christian. Now, verse 5, For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. Now, I said when God came down to redeem them, He didn't come down and redeem them because they were superior or they were better than others. God's very careful here, and He's repeated this now. This is the third time, and He says, Ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee that I may know what to do unto thee. In other words, take down your sign that you're a heathen and pagan and take a stand for God. And I personally think that was the reason that water baptism was so all important there in the early church. It was an evidence that they had left the old and now they were taking a stand for the new. And I think that it should give that kind of a testimony today. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp. Now the tabernacle is being constructed. We'll have details of it given a little later. But apparently Moses set it up first without the camp. It came to pass that every one which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation which was without the camp. Now, this tabernacle here was a tent of meeting. The tabernacle is not constructed yet in all of its detail. It's just now a tent of meeting, and it's just the bare bones of it. I think, frankly, just nothing in the world but maybe that outer fence that went around it, or just a tent put up. That's what we have here. Now it came to pass when Moses went out under the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. Now, we have something here that I hope that I can clarify. We have this question today, has anyone ever seen God? And the answer is, of course, no man hath seen God at any time. And yet, the Lord Jesus said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Now, the Lord Jesus is the revelation of God because he is God, but he was veiled in human flesh, you see. Back here, it was the angel of the Lord. And though he was there and talked with him, talked with Moses, and the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend, just like you and I would stand face to face and talk to each other. But Moses didn't see God, as we shall see. 
And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Now, this is, I think, the third time that we've had this mention of Joshua. You see, he's the man God is preparing to succeed Moses. And I don't think anyone suspected this at this time. When we get to Joshua, we'll see he was probably the most unlikely person of all. Now we have Moses turning to God again. He was a great man of prayer. Verse 12, And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider this nation is thy people. The thing that Moses wanted is the thing that Paul said, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. It's the same thing Philip meant, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And I think every sincere, real child of God today has a desire to want to know God and to want to know Christ. Now, God answers him, verse 14, and he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I'll give thee rest. Now, you see, it's the presence of God. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Moses knew he couldn't make it on his own. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. That's important to notice. God made them a peculiar people for a very definite reason, as the church is to be a peculiar people today. And that means a people for God. That doesn't mean we're to be oddballs. Verse 17, And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Now, Moses becomes very intimate, you see, with God. He said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. He couldn't see God face to face, you see, actually. He said, I'll make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I'll show mercy in whom I will show mercy. And Paul uses that in Romans, you remember. God is sovereign, and I don't have time to go into that today. Verse 20, and he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And you just well write that down, friend. You're not going to see God face to face, not today. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. It shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts. That's been an unfortunate translation. What they would see a representation of God. Because God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But God says, but my face shall not be seen. That is only a representation of God. Now, the glory, the Shekinah glory was that. You remember the Lord Jesus said that when he came the second time, that would be the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. I think that sign is the Shekinah glory. I'm of the opinion that that's what it will be. But in that day, God's glory was revealed. Now, when Christ came, he took upon himself human flesh. And when he did, the glory was not there, you see. It was not there when he came. He took a very humble place. But he was God, you see. And therefore, that's the reason he could say, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Now, you and I today are not going to see God. We're going to see the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will be in human form because that's what he took when he was down here, and he today is in a glorified body, and we shall be like him. This is the anticipation and the hope of the believers, those who are walking today by faith, friends, and that's the way Moses is going to walk. But now he says, your presence must go with us. And we need his presence today, friends, to face the problems of every day. This brings us to the end of chapter 33. We take up at chapter 34. And until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved.
If you've been going it alone, why don't you check out Dr. McGee's free digital booklet on Romans chapter 8. It's called Living the Christian Life God's Way, and it's available at ttb.org, or you can call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE for help in finding it. Well, I'm Steve Sweats, and as always, I'll meet you back here on Monday as we make our way through the Bible. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. We're grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners, whom God uses to take the whole word to the whole world.